Welcome to the Global Seminar of the Global Columbia Collaboratory. I am Shannon Marquez, Dean for Global Engagement at Columbia University, and I'm so honored that you join us today for this culminating event of a three-part global seminar series focused on Afghanistan that invites experts to step into the collaboratory to rethink recent developments, reflecting on the status of women's rights, and the Taliban's systematic efforts to institutionalize gender-based discrimination and violence against women. And now, before we begin this important discussion, and especially for those of you joining us for the first time today, I want to provide a bit of background about the Global Columbia Collaboratory. The Columbia University Center for Undergraduate Global Engagement, in partnership with Columbia Global Centers, and Columbia World Projects launched the Global Columbia Collaboratory in May 2020 as a virtual exchange initiative to support students around the world. The Collaboratory brings students, thought leaders, and educators together, promotes cross-cultural communication, and enhances skills and global competence to allow students to reflect, ideate, and collaborate to empower them to make a difference in the world. Students have participated from over 32 countries and are drawn from all three undergraduate schools at Columbia, representing over 30 majors. And we also have students participate from Sciences Po in Paris, Trinity College Dublin, Tel Aviv University, and the City University of Hong Kong all schools where we also offer dual degrees. Using smartphones and laptops to access the collaboratory virtual exchange platform, students form a community of global thinkers and problem solvers through participation in themed global seminars featuring international speakers, such as our seminar today, as well as facilitated reflection, ideation, and collaboration activities. As learnings and perspectives are shared across the collaboratory, students from project teams and receive funding to collaborate to tackle specific global issues and topics of interest. And the collaboratory serves as an incubator for bringing ideas into reality and promoting new projects and innovation solutions to global challenges. Now we are thrilled that undergraduate students from all over the world have been actively engaged in the collaboratory every semester since it launched in 2020. And we currently have a spring cohort of 56 collaboratory students joining us live today. Welcome to all of you. Now, I encourage the global audience to submit questions to the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen. Again, I wanna welcome everyone to this Global Columbia Collaboratory Seminar. And I wanna thank all of our partners and esteemed panelists. We are so pleased to be working directly with the Columbia Global Centers for these seminars. At this time, I want to introduce Safwan Masri, Columbia University Executive Vice President for Global Centers and Global Development, who will give some introductory remarks and introduce our moderator today. Safwan? Thank you, Shannon. Thank you. Good morning, everyone, uh, or good afternoon, or good evening, or whatever in the world you may be. I'm very pleased to welcome you to the third of our three part webinar series exploring the regional and global implications of recent developments in Afghanistan. Today, we are addressing the status of women's rights, eight months after the US withdrew its troops and the Taliban returned to Kabul after a 20 year hiatus from the seat of power. The Taliban has alleged that this is a more inclusive iteration of their rule than the previous version. And it has promised to protect the rights of women and of ethnic minorities. Yet it seems likely that the form of protection being offered is concerned with notions of virtue rather than rights. There are no signs that women will have access to secondary schools or to work. Instead, the rhetoric seems a necessary ploy to attract foreign aid to a country whose economy had been completely dependent upon assistance for a generation. Indeed, one takeaway from what we are seeing in Afghanistan is the way the issue of women's rights can be used cynically by both sides. In the West, it has been used to gain liberal support for a military operation in a foreign country. And in Afghanistan, the Taliban used the promise of women's rights to appease both their own populace and the international community, as well as to bludgeon the United States into unlocking Afghan assets, explaining that they cannot provide schools or transportation without money. These are women's rights as platform issues and negotiating tactics. But what has life actually been like for women and for other marginalized populations in Afghanistan over the past two decades? And how much has changed under Taliban rule? It arguably, arguably takes three generations for something to become immortalized, to become a permanent feature in collective memory. 
The U.S. was in Afghanistan for only one generation. And so perhaps the impact of presence or of its presence, the good and the bad, cannot be expected to last. Afghans today have lived in a landscape of constantly shifting alliances and with incessant warfare, but they were exposed to notions of personal freedoms and rights, including the right to an education and to an, and to an existence outside the walls of home. It is hard to imagine that the Taliban will be able to erase the impact of this. While women are uniquely vulnerable in Afghanistan, the fact that the majority of Afghanistan's young population has always known women in the public sphere changes what is possible, perhaps. But it is important to remember that Afghanistan has its own internal experience with the subject of women's rights, notwithstanding recent or past occupations, which has been characterized both by movements towards female autonomy and resistance from tribal leaders. The recent American presence and what it meant for women's rights in Afghanistan is simply one chapter, a very divisive, problematic chapter, I should add, of a longer story. Understanding that chapter requires an assessment of women's progress using concrete measures, as well as a look at how both the Taliban and the legacy of Western imperialism have jeopardized those achievements. We must also step back and ask the larger questions of who is claiming rights for whom and where and how we hear the voices of Afghan women. Finally, we can wonder whether the Taliban will pay the price for international recognition if that price means real support for women's rights. To explore these questions and more, I am very pleased now to introduce our moderator, my friend and colleague, Yasmin Ergaz, who will in turn introduce our guest, Pashtana Dorani, for what promises to be a fascinating and informative conversation. But before I do, I would like to acknowledge that our second panelist, Muska Dastagir, with the American University of Afghanistan in Kabul, has been unable to join our webinar today. Yasmin Ergaz is director of the Institute for the Study of Human Rights, director of the Gender and Public Policy Specialization, and senior lecturer in the discipline of international and public affairs at the School of International Public Affairs at Columbia University. She is also a faculty member and member of the executive committee of the Committee on Global Thought and co-chair of the University Women, Gender and Sexuality Studies Council. Her current research addresses the emergence of a global market in reproductive services and the rise of illiberal democracy and the current backlash against gender equality. Her books include Reassembling Motherhood, Procreation and Care in a Globalized World, co-edited with Jane Jensen and Sonia Michel. Yasmin has served as a consultant to international and domestic policy organizations including the OECD, UNESCO, the Millennium Villages Project, and the New York City Commission on Human Rights. And she serves on the editorial board of the Journal of Human Rights Practice, the editorial board of Ingenier, and the advisory board of the Journal of International Affairs, among others. A graduate of the University of Sussex, the University of Rome, and Columbia Law School, Yasmin has received numerous honors, fellowships, and grants, including from the Institute for Advanced Study at Princeton, Brown University, the American Council of Learned Societies, the Ford Foundation, the Italian Consiglio Nazionale della Ricerca, Inst the Institute for Social, Economic, and Policy Research at Columbia University, the Compton Foundation, and the Open Societies Foundation. Yasmin, we're thrilled to have you. Welcome, and thank you for being here today to lead our discussion. I turn it over to you. <clears throat> thank you very, very much, Professor Masri. Thank you, Dean Marcus. I have to say that when I hear my bio read out, I always think, oh my God, I'm so old. So, because <laughs> it takes a lot of time to do all of these things. But I hope that that also gives me some perspective on the issues that, um, we have to address today. What I'd like to do, I think this is an incredibly important conversation to be having and to be having at this moment. I'm very grateful to the Columbia, 
global centers and to the collaboratory, and also to Pashtana for joining us in this, this, in this conversation. I'm going to introduce uh, our, our speaker, our panelist, Pashtana Durani, and then I might make a few remarks just to launch our conversation, picking up on what Professor Masri was saying a minute ago. Pashtana Durani is the founder and executive director of LEARN, a nonprofit organization which is dedicated to innovation in education with a focus on women's rights to ensure that women, and in particular, to ensure that women and girls have access to education, our topic, our specific topic for today. She also initiated the Digital Lab as an offline library of general science, general and science subjects designed as a peer learning digital lab that offers content for grades one through 12 in two national languages in Afghanistan, Dari and Pashto. I think, uh, Pashtana, I am so pleased that you are here with us and so much also impressed with the kind of direct uh, interventions that you have been able to develop over the years and that I'm sure make an enormous impact in terms of women and girls access to education. So, um, so actually, maybe let me just say a few words about my understanding also of the importance of what we're discussing today. Professor Masri um, talked about the ways in which the issues that pertain to women and girls are used as pawns or may be used as pawns in, the poli in international politics on multiple sides. I think it will be a great day, and I've worked for this virtually my entire adult life, that I think it will be a great day when that is no longer the case. And it's clearly the case here too. But it's also really important to, to be able to situate what is happening in Afghanistan in what I think is a much broader, specifically in Afghanistan, but also on a really worldwide basis, a much broader attack against women and women's rights and girls' rights in particular. You know, it sometimes seems as though the attention of the world can only handle one crisis at a time. And so we went from thinking a lot in the United States about Afghanistan to now being totally absorbed by Ukraine. But in fact, in both contexts, issues of illiberalism, of the suppression of rights that relate to gender, and including specifically of rights that relate to women and girls, although with very different accents and with very different specific policies are central. And it's important to recognize that we are in a moment, and we are still in a moment, of global pushback against women and girls' rights. So we should not be strict into thinking that just because the rights of women and girls are used as pawns, they're not also at the heart of the politics of the people who are using them. And I wish I could say that I am confident that if there is in fact the political exchange that in this particular case, the Taliban government is seeking or will seek from the United States and other governments in order to free up the resources and enable girls to go to school, that will be the end of a repressive policy and attack on girls. But I don't have that confidence. And the reason I don't have that confidence is because in fact, I think that for many different forces with many different specific agendas all over the world, but including in Afghanistan, actually a particular policy towards the rights of women and girls is in fact central to the objectives that they may seek by being in their time 
in government. As I say, I wish that I could be more optimistic about that. I wish it really were only a ploy and that we could pay it off. But I personally don't have that level of confidence. And so I'd like to ask you, Pashtana, how do you see the situation at the moment? And where do you think we may be going? And what, are, what is the leverage that there may be to push forward on girls' right? Because that's the question in front of us right now, which is girls' right to access education. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Yasmin. Uh, if I may, I'll call you, Professor. Please. <laughs> um, I was thinking about how um, uh, Professor Masri was talking about three, it takes three generations for me and for it to become immortalized. I kept on thinking about how during my father's age, it was the Russians who invaded the country and he was young and he was going through his college years, his masters and just like, you know, holding on to his roots, but he had to leave. And then I always like made fun of him when I was young. I was like, you know, when I grow up, if something like that happens, I'm never leaving. And the irony is when uh, the Americans left, we had to leave right after them just because we didn't have any other option left. And um, I keep on thinking in my head, I'm like, uh, who will be next that might be invading Afghanistan just to see it as a threat or something else. But then again, at the same time, we are invaded by our neighbors, even if people don't like to accept it, we are invaded by two of our neighbors. In the long run, apart from the political commentary that I do as an Afghan, because that's what we do a lot of the times, um, going back to what you just asked me about women and girls, before coming to this panel discussion, um, the first thing I saw on my WhatsApp was a maktu, what we call an order, which comes from the arg or like, you know, the palace, the presidential palace. And it specifically said that uh, women are not allowed to be in office spaces anymore and they shouldn't come out of the house. And this is what was said and it was signed. And I, I, I stood there for two minutes. I was like, you know, this is Afghanistan, that's seven months ago. Women and girls were encouraged to be in offices. Women and girls were encouraged to be in schools. Now don't get me wrong, and I also want to educate many of the students who do uh, see Afghanistan through the American perspective where they're like, oh, but women rights were introduced by Americans. Well, no, <laughs> um, women rights were pretty much there in Afghanistan. Um, it has always been there when America didn't have women ministers. Afghanistan a hundred years ago had a women minister of education, Queen Sur yeah, and we had a healthcare minister in 1960s. So we were far like, you know, uh, in the future, even in the US people didn't have the right to vote. Um, now coming to the current day situation, today women are treated as bargaining or political uh, chips or political baits in today's context. Um, as much as I like to say that yes, Taliban are against education, what is the reason that they are so against it? The only reason is because the international community sees this as a sensitive subject and they know which buttons to push because the, um, as you can see the, how the transition worked from Afghanistan to Ukraine. And then all of a sudden, the minute they close the school, everybody goes back to Afghanistan, even if not the same attention, there is still more attention to it now. And that's what they're using right now. So, on Wednesday, they close the school. On Thursday, they stop women from going to the parks. On Friday, they tell women they are, you're not allowed to travel. And today they're back on, their, uh, uh, on the top of it and they're like, oh, you cannot go again to office and work there and you cannot go out. So this shows how much they're willing to go to extremes to alienate their 50% of population to get the legitimacy that is needed. And one has to look at it as a political game rather than religious. And don't get me wrong when people are like, oh, Islam is a religion of peace. It is, but in Afghanistan, it has been weaponized, radicalized. And uh, I cannot just claim that, oh, everyone in Afghanistan or in that context in the neighboring countries who practice religion see it that way. Most of the time it's radicalized to an extent where people don't see actual Islam. They see a version that only works for them and benefits them, especially the men in those countries. Now, 
what will happen to the women of Afghanistan? Women of Afghanistan are already politicized. Girls' education from class seven to class 12 is politicized. The more the uh, international community ignores Afghanistan, the more the Taliban will push against women rights in Afghanistan, against minority rights in Afghanistan, against religious rights in Afghanistan for other religious minorities. And that's where it gets scary because they can go to any extent if they were okay with burning down schools and offices and ones that took women from office to homes in the past two decades, they're willing to go to any extent even now. Today, as we talk, 26 activists can't leave the country, their passports are taken away, and the world doesn't even know what their names are because they are not allowed to come on the TV. So for women right now, the situation is grave, but it's also a country that is not honoring its own daughters, that's not even giving the home that is needed. So if I could follow up on that. Um, so yes, I understand that women are being weaponized and in a sense, half of the population is being held hostage to international politics. I, I completely understand that. But there's also, it seems to me, and I completely agree and I know I know because I actually also grew up with Afghani girls who were, you know, just like me. But, um, and I, so I, I really know that Afghanistan has a long tradition of emancipation for women. And that this is not a Western import. Yeah. So that's something that I think is very important to say. And, but let me ask you, would the Taliban be using and able to weaponize women in this way if there weren't in fact a coherence between the subordinate, the ways in which women's rights are being dismantled, you know, progressively? And what, what they actually believe is the right place of women in the society. See, this is where it, it always gets uh, tricky for us to understand how Taliban actually function. So I come from southern Afghanistan, Kandar, which uh, uh, which I like to brag is older than Afghanistan. <laughs> but apart from the fact that this uh, that is southern Taliban or southern Afghanistan's Taliban were um, part or trained by Al Qaeda, Osama bin Laden. Um, lived uh, in a village near the airport called the Osama bin Laden's village. Now, on the other hand, so the southern part of the Taliban, they're extremely religious, conservative, driven mostly by the religious politics, radicalized to an extent. And most of the two new decades, people who took up arms or the Taliban who took up arms the only ideology to enlist them into those ranks was if the, your girls go to these schools and these schools are run by infidels and by USID money who are infidels and will bring bad name to your uh, family. The first reason that people put up those and uh, took up those arms was because Hilmand being the most bombed province in the whole uh, is Central Asia, people don't like talking about it. And it's not even noted down um, because Karzai was a Pashtun and Ashraf Ghani was a Pashtun and they didn't want to withdraw their own support from their own uh, provinces. So they never highlighted it. Anyways, when you bomb people's fathers, brothers, sons, it's bound, people are bound to take revenge, especially in a country like Afghanistan where everything is mainly driven by ego. Now, I don't want to justify what the Taliban do um, and how they have done it, but it's one of the main region, um, reason was that people took up arms, young teenagers took up AK-47s was because their houses were bombed, their families were bombed. That was the first way. If that didn't work, the second way was to tell them that all these women empowerment projects, girls schools, girls learning spaces were funded by the West who actually bomb you, bring you all the miseries in the world, are infidels. And this is why we should be uh, like, you know, shrinking all those spaces. And that's why the Taliban have been bombing, burning down schools for quite even eight months ago. Now, on the other hand, there is Haqqani Network. 
Haqqani Network is actually placed and headquarters in Pakistan, and it's mainly focused on uh, sort of state within state insurgency, where the Haqqani Network focuses more on what Pakistan directs them towards, or the Pakistani intelligence services direct them towards, because uh, Pakistan is afraid of India, of their own politics, and they want someone as their allies to prolong their own policies. And right now within the Taliban, in those higher ranks where there are the, uh, the Southern Taliban are at more power, those people have been told and have enlisted all their foot soldiers with that one ideology that I just told you about. These schools are aided and funded by the West, and these are something that they will turn our women into infidels, bring us dishonor. And they don't want to alienate their foot soldiers, so they want to continue clinging on to that decision. While the Haqqani network, because Pakistan wants legitimacy for Afghanistan so that they could continue to be engaged being an ally without being replaced without replacing their allies with new allies who are not so pro-Pakistan and that's the reason Haqqani network is so okay with letting girls go so this is where I'm telling you it's not religious actually it's more political within the Taliban it, there are two factions that are fighting each other just to get legitimacy um of course, religion does play a role in this. And uh, there are like, you know, most of the time I remember when you talk to someone and I was on this uh, interview with um, La Naim. And the first thing that they tell you about is that women are told to pray at home. I told him, I was like, women and men both are told to pray, uh, pr uh, pray, right? There's no discrimination in that. How can you discriminate in learning? He's like, you know, Men are told to pray all five times a day in masjid, in the mosque actually. And women are told to pray at home if they cannot go to masjid. And that's where I thought to myself, I was like, okay, they can twist religion to whatever way they can, although that is true, they can twist religion to whatever their convenience is. And that's why they keep on, every time there's a question, they keep on telling people if a woman gets her first period, by second period, she should be married off. So she shouldn't be in school and she should be from age 13 to 18. They're basically not supposed to be in school. And they use that as religion, as twist, because they can, because we have led them. And because the US legitimized them for the past three years, because there were white scholars who actually whitewashed them for the past three years, made them humans. They are still terrorists, right? So it's always political. If it was religious, uh, they would be praying right now. They wouldn't be murdering people. Yeah, I'm really, uh, I, I really, I agree with you. And I, I thank you for, for those comments. I'm wondering if there are questions. Um, Professor Masri, would you like to follow up with Pashtana or shall we ask for other questions from the audience? Yeah, we should. Uh, I mean, this is, it, uh, I would love to continue to listen to Pashtana. So maybe what I would love to do is, uh, you know, maybe not even in response to questions, Pashtana, you know, what else would you like to share with us that you think it, um, you know, we are uh, missing perhaps in, in, in not asking you, but you think are important um, developments that we should be aware of and also things that we should be thinking about, you know, so what role can we play, um, for example, um, you know, as academics, as scholars, as, uh, you know, um, people with access, perhaps, uh, in the United States and around the world. Um, you know, one of the things that uh, we do here at Columbia is we have global centers around the world, right? And so, um, we have, um, and, and, and in response to the Afghanistan crisis, we coordinated efforts across the university to host Afghan scholars, uh, both here on campus and at the Global Center. So we have uh, two Afghan scholars who have been given fellowships at the Global Center that we have in Amman, Jordan. Unfortunately, they couldn't get visas to come to Jordan, but they have joined us at least uh, remotely, and we have been trying to see if we can locate them uh, at one of the or host them at one of the other global centers, maybe in Mumbai, maybe in Istanbul, maybe even in Paris. 
Uh, we have about five scholars that we are able to host here on campus. Um, we're doing things for students um, and we've, uh, so, so, I mean, you know, it's, it's, it's a big question, uh, but what, what can we do? I mean, you know, we're trying hard um, and as Yasmin said, you know, everything has now in the media has shifted towards uh, the Ukraine, but we continue to be focused, of course, on Afghanistan, on Yemen, on Syria, and other parts of the world that seem to be ignored by the media. Yeah. 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 Thank you so much for highlighting that. I always think um, as a woman, as a woman of color, and especially a person who has seen by the misogyny, racism, and sexism within my own country, so I don't even have to claim that I saw all this in the US. I saw it back home first. Um, the world media tend to either make heroes out of people who don't deserve to be there, let's be honest, and then tends to ignore the victims of the war just because they are not um, newsworthy enough, like Syria, Yemen, and Afghanistan. And at the same time, when you ask me the question, what can be done? And I'm a very practical person. I like uh, giving answers on those ends, right? Uh, first of all, thank you so much for hosting the Afghan scholars. One thing that I keep on seeing is the fact that Afghan intelligentsia, I, I was thinking about it yesterday. I was like, there's a genocide against the Afghan intelligentsia right now. And it is so true because majority of us have to flee up uh, our houses, our homes, our places of growth and comfort where we could have done much more. The second thing is our families are under pressure because they are also being persecuted for our stances. And last but not the least, majority of these scholars who have left some of them have gotten good places like Columbia. Some of them are in other universities that I know of. Some of them are still uh, like, you know, lacking behind or are in, uh, in those spaces where they are either refugees, where they don't have any um, thing to look forward to. And that's where it scares me a lot is that there's an intellectual genocide of Afghanistan and nobody knows about it. One of my professors for anthropology last, um, semester, he was teaching us this one thing where he was like, you know, in the 70s and the 80s, the Soviet, uh, when they came to Afghanistan, actually murdered people who were pro-democracy, the intellectuals who were pro-democracy. And then in the past two decades, a lot of the people, if you see the pattern, is people who were actually pro, either pro-liberal education, liberal arts, or any of those things, they're always targeted. And right now it's the same thing. So you always see that out of the masses, when that one person is targeted, we need to protect that one person because those are the people who will be leading Afghanistan in the future, hopefully. So for me, it's very important to see uh, that in practical terms, I think Colombia could definitely, apart from hosting scholars, help with uh, on the ground uh, research when it comes to girls' education. There's not a lot of research done on girls' education in Afghanistan. People tend to um, rely on these bigger organizations and I can't, not even get started on how they are feeling in Afghanistan massively because they are there and they're not solving the problems because they're making a career out of it. Yeah. But, but what Colombia could do is actually challenge that narrative. So uh, UNAMA is, has been there for two decades, right? What is their biggest uh, uh, like, you know, solution that they have brought to Afghanistan? Nothing, because they keep on engaging, but they don't bring out solutions because every poor Afghan kid that goes out with that picture, that starving kid, actually supplies more to donations and those donations help with their salaries. So when you debunk it or uh, unpack it, um, it shows that people back home, uh, all these international organizations are actually making their careers out of our trauma porn. And please excuse my language, but that is the reality of Afghanistan right now. Colombia could basically focus on girls' education, alternatives to girls' education, research on girls' education, how it, the uh, gap could be filled, and those research policies should be presented at the UN. I am screaming at the top of my lungs that digital literacy works, that Starlink yeah. can work in Afghanistan, just like it worked in Ukraine. I've been engaging with Starlink for more than 18 months, but at the same time, not a single international organization has once reached out to me and told me, okay, this is something that could work. Maybe 
uh, come uh, and I'm not even saying, oh, I want to lead it. I'm saying this is for my people. Do it in every province on district level. And I'm willing to work on it. Right. But nobody will ever do that because it actually solves the problem of literacy. It actually solves the problem of girls working. Right. So. The best thing would be investing in research that focuses on solutions in Afghanistan, especially alternatives to learning, especially girls' education. Um, most of the time when governments ask me, what should we do? I tell them the Taliban just uh, limited girls, uh, women leaving the country, right? Without a uh, You were the ones who went around the whole world last three years to put them off the travel sanctions list put them back on sanctions list. You know, they shouldn't be the ones traveling right now. You're putting a whole country under starvation, but you are not okay with putting the Taliban on uh, travel sanction list, right? You always have to be smart. I keep on telling people this, that you can't treat people with cancer cure from the last century. Then how are you treating Afghanistan's current political crisis with sanctions that were invented in the last century yeah. that yeah. haven't even worked, you know? Yeah. Um, so uh, I think academic uh, institutions like yours, the best thing that can be done for Afghanistan is focus on solutions or uh, give spaces for those solutions to grow, to be implemented in the long run, to have that research and show the world, okay, this country might be poor. There is a group that is uh, extremist and doesn't want women to grow. Then there are people like us who are actually working to make it a better, who are challenging it, who are resisting what they are doing right now. So we always have to come up with that uh, solution, but also present it to the world. And most of the time, people don't listen to Afghans because, um, we are seen through that victim uh, lens sure, most of the sure, time. Sure, uh, sure. When I go somewhere, I'm, they're like, oh, poor you, because you don't have your family with you, right? They don't see the fact that uh, I fought all my life to be where I am, and I'm not a victim. I call myself a warrior because I fought throughout all of that, right? And um, I still made it, right? In a tribal conservative family, I made it. So many like me can make it only if the right tools are given to them, only the right platforms are given to them. Yeah. Thank you, Pastana. This is so rich, really, and uh, so, so incredibly helpful. And, uh, you know, on your last comment, uh, totally, because, you know, we tend to look from the West sort of through a prism um, that's somewhat, you know, culturally imperialist. And yeah. even when we look at feminism in a place like Afghanistan, um, you know, we use, we see it in, in, in you know, through an essentialist lens also. Yeah. And uh, we try to impose sort of a Western definition of feminism. So I loved what you said about studying feminism and studying women's issues in Afghanistan yeah. in collaboration with Afghan. Yeah. Uh, scholars exactly now there we have are. we have some really great questions from the audience but if it's okay with you Yasmin I think you wanted to make a comment I'm going to turn it over to Shannon so that she can introduce the student who has a question for you Pashtana no that's that's fine with me I would like to continue this conversation um, because I completely agree with what you have said and with what Professor Masri has said I also think that um, there are times when the critique of all forms of feminism tends to, I've worked for many, many years with human rights advocates and many of them have worked on, human, on women's rights. And I would never want to say to any of them that there are nothing but the echo of my thoughts, right? I learn from them, I work with them, and I completely agree that, I agree totally with you when you were talking about also the interests that international organizations have in self-perpetuation. Yeah. But I wonder then what are the alternatives? I think that we, we need to sort of start thinking yeah. about a new geography um, of institutions, of channels, of modes of communication, and systems of governance and how we can go forward. All right, so it's obviously a very 
long I, conversation? I, I, I just want to comment. Uh, it will be short, I promise, Shannon. <laughs> um, so when you um, focus on the, uh, when you say you work with uh, advocates, you know, because you know them personally, you know that this is what happens, right? And this is something that a lot of international organizations in Afghanistan don't do. Um, they see us as most of the time as a case study for their own reports. And that's where it gets more tricky for them to understand that, okay, uh, I might come from a tribal family uh, in a 300 year old history where I might be the only woman who has come out in public and shown her face and talks and stuff like that. Nobody in my family does that. Nobody has their pictures on, I'm like the only woman who is there in, out in public. Um, when we do all of that, it's not that we are breaking the barriers or we are doing something new or whatever. We're just trying to evolve, trying to meet the new challenges of the world, trying to find solutions for that. But most of the time when we tell that to the international community in Afghanistan, they're like, oh, but the government says this. Our last government was corrupt. I kept on telling everyone this is corrupt. You need to go back and report it. You need to ask questions. How can you let the taxpayers money come here and not ask questions? Where is the accountability? Because people People have been robbed off in the Western countries too, right, from their money. But nobody asked those questions. Everyone was like, oh, but you know, why? Because they got a few gifts from the Afghan elites, like a few dry fruits, a cute coat, and that they could go back and at home and tell them, oh, you know, my trip in Afghanistan, it was such a pleasant trip. And I met this woman and that woman. And then out of that bubble, they never met the real people. Right. They never met the Afghans. Afghans, I always tell people that Afghanistan starts when you come out of Kabul, when you go to all these 33 provinces, and those are the important things. And alternatives to those um, bigger organizations. I think there needs to be a model that needs to be introduced, uh, where when you go into a country and when you start engaging with people, you need to follow up with policies. You need to develop policies that are put in place. You do engage with them, but also have practical terms. Okay, you're engaging with the Taliban, but what is the end solution? What is that engagement? Are you going there for some pictures? Is that what you want? And so those are the sort of things that somebody has to ask. But most of the time when people get up at those top positions, I don't know what happens to them. Either they become super polite or like, you know, because it's their job at stake, people tend to become very muted and they don't yeah. like highlighting or asking the tough questions. And I would want someone in that position and ask those tough questions for once. Yeah, yeah. Right. Powerful words, Pashtana. Thank you so much for elaborating on that. And these points are really important for our students also to hear. And now I'd really like to introduce uh, Sydney Lozikov Carey, an undergraduate student who will be asking a live question today. Now, Sydney is an active participant in the Spring 22 Collaboratory and is a second year student studying Middle Eastern Studies and Biology at the International School of Tel Aviv University. Her passion is in women rights. The goal of uh, what she wants to do when she finishes school is to become an OBGYN for displaced women in refugee camps. Sydney has volunteered with refugees on the border of Syria, as well as worked with underserved communities in Guatemala, Turkey, Israel, and Tanzania, and is currently working as an activist for survivors of female genital mutilation. She is honored to be able to ask the question today. Welcome, Sydney. Hi, um, thank you so much. Um, and I'll ask my question as fast as possible. Um, I recently listened to a podcast featuring Dr. Dean Sharzai, who in 2003 was appointed the Deputy Minister of Health in Afghanistan. He worked to implement one of the most modern, successful post-conflict healthcare systems that the country had seen post-conflict. Um, woman empowerment was at the center of this framework, disguising education of Afghan women as medics as health care for women and children. This eventually flipped the switch when Taliban men would come to the women medics for health issues and allowed for their empowerment, leading to some of these medically trained women even rising to positions in the Afghan parliament. Um, so my question is, do you think that this method, reframing education, was truly effective and could work in the future with the Taliban in power? How might this method look different for women in urban settings um, versus rural settings? Um, and that was my question. Thank you so much. 
Thank you so much. So I think that's one of the smartest questions that have been asked on a panel because most of the time people don't do research in Afghanistan uh, uh, with the weavers, right? Um, one thing I, I think we need to understand that yes, um, the foot soldiers, they most of the time they don't understand and uh, they don't have that sort of um, mental capacity to see women in workspace talking to them other than mother, their sister, their wife, which are also dismissed most of the time because they are women in their house. They're not supposed to talk. They're not supposed to show their face, everything of that sort. And don't get me wrong, culturally, we do, uh, we have some sort of things that um, are sort of supposed to be that way. My mom, she still hides her face from my three uncles because they're older than my father, right? So it's a different world, different country, and some of the things are culturally normal and accepted by women and men and everyone. Now, coming back to your topic, when it comes to the question of like, if we educate women to become doctors, does that, or medics or midwives, uh, does that justify, or like, you know, helps us justify education for the Taliban? Most of the times it works. I'm gonna be honest with you. Uh, when I used to work with the villages, what we used to do is I used to go to uh, every village and we used to tell them that I'm gonna open a school here and I'm gonna sponsor it for five years. Now, in um, and you are gonna send your daughters to school and return uh, for you to send your daughters to school. I'm gonna send you doctors every week or every two weeks when we could afford it um, and uh, they will see all your women they will uh, check your women and everything but then in return you have to send your daughters to school and once uh, the, your daughters are graduated they are enrolled in a midwifery school or whatever and they are graduated when they are back um, then we stop sending doctors because you'll have doctors on your own that helped a lot. That helped a lot in returning girls in, uh, to schools. And it helped and it worked better than um, the World Food Programs policy where they used to give girls biscuits and flour and oil so that they could come to school because this thing was something that people couldn't afford. Um, World Health Organization itself says that 80% of Afghans have access to uh, healthcare within the two hours of driving to a place that has uh, a clinic or something of that sort. But now the funny thing is, many houses, many villages don't have motor cars. They don't have cars at all to go and do the two hours driving. And especially uh, when you are poor, you are under the poverty line. Most of the time you can't afford to take your women to a two hour drive and then back home. So that was a big cha a cha a change when we used to give them free healthcare checkup, free ultrasound, free um, uh, medicine. And in return, they just had to send their two daughters or one daughter to school for free. Like that was so good. Right now, yes, there are times where a few places women might be allowed to, uh, girls might be allowed to get their education just because they want doctors in return. It's helpful most of the time when you give them that narrative, but right now it's again politicized. Um, you can always use that challenge. You can always give them uh, religious backgrounds. You can always give them all these, in Pashto we call it kinat, which is like, you know, give them all those narratives that this is reality. This is how uh, religion or culture works in Afghanistan. But the problem is right now, the women and girls situation, uh, education and crisis, Everything is used as a political bait and you can't tell a man who has followed the Taliban for 20 years to let their daughter study um, because they need doctors in the future because they'll be like, oh, but the Amir said something else. Although in the long run, they know that I mean, cannot provide doctors for them. They know that women are going to die from that, but they cannot let go of that uh, acceptance of their Amir because they're following him for two decades. It's like following a toxic parent for more than two decades where you can't let go of that decision. So it's one of those things. But I definitely agree. This could be even used by the international organizations in the long run as a solution to educate more and more women. That's what we do most of the times. Uh, we have around seven schools right now, secret schools in Afghanistan, right now that we are telling them that if these 100 women are educated, we'll sponsor 20 of them in medical schools. And we started with our first uh, girl in Kandahar and she's at the top of her class. So when yeah. you're in girls, it always helps. But it's always like, you know, you always have to see what sort of community it is, how much do they follow the army, stuff like that. Yeah. It's great. Thank you Thanks. so much. Can I ask a follow up on that? Sure. So health is a particular kind of thing, right? Are there yeah. other 
are there other sectors which might be used in the same way, which might have the yeah. same? So one thing, Yasmin, if we need to see is that in Afghanistan, um, mothers are loved. They're respected. I know in majority of the cultures are, but in Afghanistan, they're most particularly loved. Um, my brother, he worships my mother. <laughs> the same goes for a lot of uh, people. And especially in the Taliban, they do listen to their mothers because um, uh, a, Islam says a lot about the mothers and her role, but also at the same time, because mother is the only place that they feel safe enough to talk, especially men. So I feel like, you know, um, most of the time when I'm engaging with uh, uh, in a village, I don't go to the men in the village. I actually go to the women elder in the village. And that women elder always helps more than the men because they have good convincing powers. I tell you that this the best way to go and work in a community is tell the older women. Like, you know, you tell her that um, I'm going to get you a well, just get me the school and she will do it. So, of course, it's not a particular different industry, but it's definitely something that we could look into. But these contexts are never explored or these resources are never explored because people don't understand that they, if there is a man tribal chief, there's always a woman tribal chief in Afghanistan too. So that's the perspective we miss. Go to the mothers, tell them, what is your biggest challenge right now in Afghanistan, in that village? And she'll tell you, oh, I don't have a well, I don't have a clinic, um, I don't have electricity, right? And you tell her, I promise I'll bring you that. And in return, you have to open a school in your house. You'll oversee it. Uh, we will pay for the teachers. We'll give you everything, but you, uh, but this is the, the, like, you know, the give and take. And it always works. Trust me, it always works. <laughs> That's great. That's great. Uh I, I see you. an interesting question in the chat that perhaps could be a good follow-up. And the question is, uh, one, thanking you, Pashtana, for all of your thoughts and comments. Uh, this person says that their law school clinic represents asylum seekers, including many Afghan families. They have observed other organizations, including resettlement agencies, deferring to the patriarch of each family to speak and make all decisions for the family while treating their female counterparts paternalistically. They justify this as respecting Afghan culture. So the question is, how can advocates and community members support fellow women and lift their voices while respecting cultural differences? I think that this, um, you, you spoke a bit about this, but I think that this question really is, is asking for more with regard to this context. I think one thing, um, and this was the question that was actually asked by an Afghan diaspora from me when they were working with Afghan refugees here. They were like, how do we communicate with the women? And uh, how do we communicate with the men? Um, most of the time, the men feel shy when they are talking to a doctor or someone in medical uh, procedure and something of that. So it's the women is like the first one who is communicating and engaging. But even if they're the two of them are engaging, the best thing would be like, you know, giving them that safe space. It's the most important thing that could be done. Um, most of the time, we are a community, we don't talk about um, sex life, we don't talk about uh, even uh, maternal health care, it's uh, frowned upon, right? There's no show of affection apart from the paternal and maternal uh, affection, other things are frowned upon. So you have to see that there needs to be a, a safe space for them to open up, to talk about, but also how much, um, like, you know, uh, if you are intellectually on another level, how much are you willing to come on their intellectual level and communicate with them? Most of the time, they will be very smart people, but they wouldn't want to open up to you because they don't feel safe with you or they don't have that language skills to communicate with you. So it's always a different narrative and challenge, but you always have to see um, and navigate through it with more um, uh, I, I feel like, you know, safe, but also safety, uh, especially what people go through, especially women in Afghanistan, the trauma that they go through. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you, thank you. And we hope, you know, that one day uh, these asylum seekers and the resettled um, refugees are able to go back um, yes, to yes. thriving and vibrant uh, Afghanistan because, you know, to rebuild the country when it's time to do that, you need that talent. I mean, you know, unfortunately what often happens is that some of the greatest talent ends up being the uh, one that that um, that leaves and is yeah, able to resettle elsewhere. As this is this is the one of the reasons like uh, uh, when my friends were uh, evacuating me, I remember them specifically, they're like, look, we know you 
And we know for a fact that if you seek asylum, you would want to go back home after four months and then we wouldn't be able to help you. And they're like, see, this is how you go. And they actually, I'm going to be honest, they actually helped me. Uh, I remember Amna Nawaz, she's a previous reporter. She actually got me a J1 as a scholar, right? Because she knew that I would want to go back. And she that was so true because I planned to go back even this summer to see my schools and everything, um, safety permitting. So this is really uh, important. Afghanistan has amazing people and, and it's not just because it's my country. I see the intelligence, I see the artists, I see the people that I meet and I envy the fact that we are not in our country, that we can't celebrate this art, this academics, these books and the fact that libraries back home are burned down and here uh, we don't have that uh, capacity to build what we left back home. So yeah. <laughs> But you will, you will, yeah. and you are, and you are um, doing so uh, from afar. Um, I mean, Pashtana, I can't thank you enough. And I can't thank you enough, not only for what you've done today and, and what you contributed to us and to our understanding and to our intelligence about Afghanistan, but I can't thank you enough for the great work that you do. Uh, you're an inspiration. You really are. Um, you are um, somebody to... Uh, look up to and learn from, uh, not only in the Afghanistan context. And I really mean that, uh, you know, from the bottom of my heart, I am in awe uh, of you and of people like you. And and um, I feel little, uh, you know, when I hear somebody like you, <laughs> of all the work that we do, you know, it's a drop in the ocean, but every drop in the ocean uh, wow. doesn't matter at the end of the day. Um, so thank you, Yasmin, um, you're just terrific. And thank you for really uh, bringing in your perspectives um, into this discussion and for um, moderating this wonderful, wonderful conversation. I'm going to turn it uh, to you. Uh, I mean, Yasmin, if you want to make any closing remarks, and then Shannon will, uh, will conclude the event for us. Well, I just want to say also uh, to echo, really, Safwan's words. Ashtana, you really are an example for all of us. And I've understood so much from this conversation with you, including about the agenda or the difficulty of establishing a clear agenda that would enable us to help in some significant manner. So, uh, and also not to do harm. You know, the first, the first precept for physicians is do no harm. <laughs> Right, and I think that's the first lesson. And then the second lesson is how do we help? Yeah. And that requires a lot of listening and recognizing that we have resources, but often we don't have knowledge and understanding. One of the greatest sociologists, Max Weber, said to under that any social scientific knowledge depends on your ability to understand from the perspective of the actor. Yeah. And I think that that's really, um, we can't, that's what you bring us. And I thank you so much. And I thank you for your bravery. Because yes. I know that it's really not obvious to engage in the work that you do and even to engage in the conversations like this. So yeah. thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Safwan. Thank you, Shannon. And thank you to all our participants. Yes. Um, yeah. Uh, On that note. I just want to thank everyone and especially the fact that both Safwan and Yasmin took the time focused on Afghanistan, but also the perspective that we bring. Most of the time it is unpopular, but it's the reality of Afghanistan. So I really want to thank you. And uh, it's an honor to be at this panel. I used to dream about like, you know, I believe in Colombia. Now, now I want a panel like that. So <laughs> it's a I'm going to be honest. Thank you so much. Thank Indeed. You. Shannon, Indeed. I mean, um, Shannon has been uh, my partner in this, our partner in this. And I also want to acknowledge the uh, staff of the Global Centers in New York, uh, particularly in Istanbul uh, and in Amman, who worked hard on uh, putting this together. Shannon, you have the last word. <laughs> oh, thank you. I mean, we've truly had a powerful discussion on women's rights in Afghanistan. Pashtana, thank you for your inspiring words and your time. 
We've learned so much from you today. This was very powerful for the students as well and the global audience. This was the third seminar in a series of seminars focused on Afghanistan, delivered as part of the Global Columbia Collaboratory, our virtual exchange platform that's brought students, thought leaders, and educators from around the globe together to reflect, ideate, and collaborate to make an impact. We are looking forward to our next series of collaboratory seminars, which will be launched this summer. So please keep an eye out for the announcement. Thanks again to our esteemed moderator and panelists, Yasmin and Pashtana, who joined us today. And many thanks to the team at the Columbia Global Centers, Columbia World Projects, Columbia College, the Center for Undergraduate Global Engagement. And of course, extending a very special thank you to our collaboratory students from around the world, partners and participants as well. A reminder that a link to the recording of the full webinar will be sent to everyone who registered and for others you'll be able to find it on our website. Thank you and be well. <laughs>